spoke before and we agreed that um, you're Steve and I'm Silvana. Correct. There's no Mr. <laughs> McCurry or okay. Miss Simons, because um, we're friends. Right. And um, like I said, we spoke before on the phone and the first thing that uh, struck me was your modesty. Mm -hmm. um, when we met on the phone, I have to tell you this, I didn't tell you this before, I didn't know what you looked like. I hadn't Googled you or anything because I wanted to really meet you first. And then when I did meet you, you looked exactly the way you sounded on the phone. <laughs> That's Handsome scary. and charming and modest. Okay. So I have a lot to be modest about. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's your opinion, I'm sure. Like I said, you have made one of the most um, incredible pictures ever, a picture that we all know that we're, we're going to look at in a minute. But there's so much more that you've done that we would also like to, to, to look at. And this is one of them. Mm -hmm. Let's start with this picture, um, a picture of a mother and a child. Uh, when was this taken? Uh, this was taken in uh, 1996. I was, uh, you know, I, I love India. I've been to India maybe 80 or 90 times. When I was uh, 12 years old, I saw a magazine article, Life magazine, about the monsoon. And it really captured my imagination. And I thought, you know, someday I want to go to India and experience that monsoon. Well, you know, fast forward 20 years, I, I found myself at National Geographic. And I said, you know, I'd like to go back and recreate that story that I saw in Life magazine, they gave me this assignment. One morning, I was in a taxi, heavy rain, and this mother and child came to my window. I was sitting in the back seat, very relaxed, and she came up and, and they were looking into my window, and I guess they may have been looking for some money or whatever. I, I kind of instinctively raised my camera, I made two exposures, and the, the traffic light changed and off we went. And two months later, I was looking through my film, and I saw this picture, and I thought, oh my God, that's, that's a, I love that picture, this is really amazing. And I, it occurred to me, you know, I'm sitting in this sort of air-conditioned bubble, and this mother and child out in the heavy rain, it's, it's hot, there's traffic, there's pollution, and they're kind of looking in the window, trying to see if who's there, maybe there's some opportunity for us. And it really felt like this sort of collision of two cultures, of two worlds. Yeah. And uh, it was one of those brief encounters which stay with you forever, but uh, is so fleeting. When you say, um, um, I grabbed my camera and I clicked, and then two months later, I saw the pictures. Now, to a lot of us, that's like, why wait two months if you can instantly just you know, check? But obviously, yeah. at the time, you were still working with film. Do you still do that? No, I've completely switched over to digital. You know, digital is so wonderful because we can uh, see the pictures right away. And uh, if we need to adjust or modify or whatever, we can do it right there, right then. And um, you can also show the picture to your subject. Yeah. And uh, that's a great uh, benefit. We know that um, um, portraits is one of your um, specialties. Yet the first two pictures we're seeing, this one as well, um, it looks like you were accidentally standing on some road and a woman walked by. Is that the case? Or did you, did you still orchestrate the image? Well, I was in this uh, ancient city in India called Brindavan. And Brindavan is, I would say, kind of infamous because it's, they call it the city of widows. And we were walking down the street and I saw this lady uh, and uh, she, I thought, how can she kind of move in that condition? So I was very intrigued and fascinated. I started following her, taking her picture. And after five or 10 minutes, she sort of, I guess she looked over and said, well, who is this guy following me? So we started a conversation. And uh, it, it turned out that she had been married when she was uh, 14 years old. And shortly after that, she had become, she had become a widow. And there's sort of a stigma, kind of a bit of, bad karma, which is associated with the woman becoming a widow. So her family sent her off to this village to basically live the rest of her life, uh, to live in an ashram. And that, so we, she explained all this, and I asked her, do you mind if we follow you? Anyway, she turned out to be this very, uh, she had a great sense of humor. She invited us to her house for, for tea. Uh, and despite the fact that she had this sort of infirmity and this extremely sort of 
uh, unfortunate life. I found her uh, uplifting, inspiring, and I thought somebody who has that kind of resilience is a much better person than me, to be able to still have a smile on your face and to have that you know, resilience, I thought it's just uh, amazing. I've never forgotten her. It, it, it's, it's funny to me, what's funny to me in this picture is that one would think that seeing this lady walk down the street, to capture her in a picture would get you a picture that says, I pity you, or um, I even, uh, it, might be even, it might even be condescending in, 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 in some way, yet when you describe the woman, which you only got to know after you took the picture, I have to think that maybe you saw all of that still as she was, she was walking by. Do you, do you give yourself an assignment for every picture you take? Or is it just, I see a beautiful composition just happening and mm -hmm. click, there I go. Well, the serendipitous moment, the chance encounter is what I sort of live for and what is the, to me the most rewarding part of my photography. Uh, but this woman, there was no self-pity whatsoever. There was this sort of joy and the, the, the pleasure of being alive, despite the fact that she was in this sort of seemingly terrible situation. Now, you spoke earlier before that, you said earlier that um, now that you, you use digital cameras, um, you can adjust a picture. Um, there's always a lot of debate amongst photographers, and we're all photographers these days, aren't we? Um, about, yeah, we, are, we, are, we all have our iPhone, our Blackberries, right. and we all think, oh yeah, I can do this, and if it doesn't work, I'll just throw some filter on it, yeah, and yeah. it'll still look amazing. How do you feel about um, 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 adjusting your, your, your pictures? Well, is, I, there anything, is there anything in this picture that you've yeah. enhanced? No, I believe that the picture should reflect exactly what you saw and experienced when you took the picture. I, I don't think you should have any adjustments in terms of uh, you know, Photoshop, uh, kind of uh, garish colors. And I, I want to just capture life as it is without really interfering. And I want it to reflect reality, actually. Now, here we have a picture that is so different from the ones we've seen before and uh, probably uh, more into the, the style that people know of you, which is portraits. But rarely do you take portraits, well, this is something I'm assuming, um, that have such a deliberate message. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us the story about this picture? Yeah. Well, I was in Sri Lanka at the time, and I got a call from the New York Times asking if I would be interested in going to, uh, to Burma and photographing the uh, Nobel Prize laureate uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. And of course, I instantly said, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a plane in the next five minutes. Uh, I mean, I had been in Burma six months a few years later, and uh, she, people were, wouldn't even refer to her by her name. They just referred to her as, as the lady. Uh, and, uh, but we met her, and I was so uh, sort of astonished at her. She's this petite, very feminine, very beautiful uh, woman, very articulate and uh, very intelligent, but tough as nails, and really had a very clear idea of what she thought the future of Burma should be. Uh, and um, she spent uh, almost two decades under house arrest, and uh, to spend that time with her was just a remarkable, I was, you know. Um, now, of course, she's part of the government, and uh, she's, uh, I mean, one of my heroes, and I think uh, there's, uh, I think we can all learn a lot from her and, and that uh, bravery. Yeah, yeah. Well, bravery seems to be a theme that um, keeps coming back into your pictures over and over again. As we look at this picture, obviously we all want to know how it came about. Did you realize at the time when you were taking this picture that it would change so many things, the way we view the world, the way we view women in these situations, the way we view photography, the, the, the power of image in itself? This is a one second this is a one moment. What happened in, the, in that moment? Uh, well, this picture was taken in a girls' school in a refugee camp in uh, Pakistan. And when I walked into the classroom, it was actually a tent, I saw this little girl, Sharbat Gula, 
off in the corner, and I was immediately struck by her, her look, her face, her eyes, and I knew that this was going to make an incredible portrait. And I tried, you know, I was thinking, how can I do this? I don't want her to refuse. Maybe she's shy. Uh, eventually, the teacher in the classroom said, you know, it's really important that the world know our story, know your story. So please, you know, help this photographer. So she, she sat down. She looked into my lens. I think she was very curious. She had never been photographed in her life. And I was, uh, you know, sitting watching this incredible little girl. And uh, it's one of those once-in-a-lifetime pictures where the, the light was right, her expression was right, um, the background. It, it's, there's such a sense of uh, authenticity about the picture. It's not posed. She's just sitting there. She wasn't, I didn't ask her to do this or to do that. She's just looking into my lens, giving me this very honest expression. Um, and after uh, one minute, maybe two minutes, she got up and just walked away. And she thought uh, <laughs> that was the end yeah. and went back to playing with her friends in the classroom. Uh, again, I, I didn't see the picture for, again, six weeks or whatever. I got back, and as I was going through the film, I, I looked at this picture and thought, oh my, this is a, an incredible picture. It, and it ended up on the cover of the National Geographic magazine. And not, I don't think a day has gone by since 1985 that we haven't received a letter, an email, a request of some kind wanting to help her, to find out more information about her. And that continued up until today. We actually went back and looked for her, trying to find her. We were so much interest in her. Uh, and uh, by just some sheer miracle, we were able to find her again in 2002. And we found out that she was a you know, mother. She had some three daughters. And uh, we immediately wanted to help her and actually compensate her for the use of that picture uh, 17 years earlier. And uh, we actually keep in touch with her even today and uh, want to make sure that anything we can do to help her in her right. life and her family, we're there to support her. Now, we understand that picture changed a lot, like I said, maybe even for photography itself, but what did that do, what did it mean to you personally? Because then you became the photographer that shot that picture. Yeah, that picture changed my life. Uh, that's the first line which will be in my obituary. <laughs> it will be, uh, you know, Steve McCurry, the photographer, shot the Afghan girl. Uh, but yeah, I'm very proud, I'm very honored, uh, I'm humbled to be uh, associated with that picture. I think that uh, to have a picture which has resonated with so many people around the world, uh, I, I just think it's a, it's a privilege to have made that picture. And uh, uh, I'm always uh, willing to talk about it and describe it. Um, but uh, I think hopefully it's been a win-win situation for her and for me. So as I said, we keep in touch with her. And hopefully um, her life has been made better by this picture. Now, one of two things could have happened after you make such a picture. Either you, you thrive on the success of it and, uh, and bloom further, or a picture like this could, could also take, take you hostage because then you have made one of the most incredible pictures ever. You look at your camera and you're like, now I gotta do it again. <laughs> ever felt that yeah. way? No, no, I, I, never, uh, I never look back. I, I, you know, I'm very passionate about my work. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to have made that picture, but I have a lot more uh, pictures in me, a lot more places I wanna go and explore. Uh, to me, photography is a great adventure. I wanna go and uh, see new places and meet new people. Uh, if I ever make such a, a great picture again, like that one, uh, great. If I don't, then that's okay too. Yeah, because traveling is very important to you. Um, you. You specifically go out to certain places to find your subjects and the surroundings. Can you tell us where this picture is taken and what's the story behind the people in the picture? I was commissioned by the Global Fund to go to Vietnam to uh, photograph four families the 
husband, the father in the family, had contracted AIDS, and my uh, brief was to uh, document the life, particularly of, of the women who were left having to support the family. Uh, there was a great stigma uh, with the father having AIDS, and the struggle that this, these wives had to endure was just unmen you know, un unthinkable. Um, they, they, they had to go out and you know, make the living for the family, and uh, they were so, uh, so strong and, and, and such great love to be able to do that for their husbands. In some cases, unfortunately, the husbands died, but in other cases, we had um, one situation where uh, we went to um, the hospital with this young wife, and we discovered that the husband had uh, transferred, that she, he, he had infected her with, with AIDS. And uh, the devastation that came over her and, and the pain was so, uh, you know, incredible. Just, and to be able to, 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 to have to photograph her in that situation was about the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But I, uh, I, I just forced myself. I knew that it was important, that this was a critical part of the story to show people that, that the pain and agony that people have to go through that have to deal with this terrible uh, disease. Women, the pictures we've seen so far, women play uh, a very important part in the stories that you want to share with the world. Is there a specific reason for that? That you feel that women are the ones that need, to, that, that deserve the limelight, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, in order for these stories to be told? Well, as I've traveled around the world, I, I've observed that in, in most cases, uh, women have to do the heavy lifting in the family. Um, while the men are out, you know, relaxing under the tree, often the women are the ones uh, gathering wood, gathering, get going for water, uh, working in the kitchen, raising the children. And in fact, they practically do all the work yep. in, in the home. And uh, that's a story that needs to be told. Especially since they're not always recognized as, uh, as such. True. So we see all these very supportive supportive women, um, grieving women, I, I, I assume these are women at a grave? Yes, the, the fathers died, and now the wife on the right is left having to raise the children, have, has to go out and uh, get a job, and uh, actually raise and run the house from yeah. there on out. Yeah. This is that young mother who is in the back seat as we were driving back to her, her home. And she realizes she's 21 years old, she's, her husband is dying, and she has this young child. And uh, she's probably thinking, you know, my life is over. How can I endure? How can I go on? And I, I, as I turned her, I thought, you, know, you, you can't photograph, you can't sort of invade somebody's privacy. And how do you, how do you uh, judge that decision in that moment, whether it's the mother and child in the monsoon, whether it's uh, the wife who just found out that she is also infected, this young mother, you're, you're very close. Mm -hmm. um, it's really a moment-to-moment -moment decision. Uh, she and her husband have given us permission to kind of live with them, to photograph them, and Again, as I turned to take this picture, I thought, this is so terrible. But I knew that it was an important part of the story. If she had sort of waved me off and said, I would have stopped in a second. But I just thought, this is something, this is a story. Her story needs to be told. And so I, I took maybe three exposures, and then I, I stopped. Now, this picture... This picture, we can hear it as it comes on the screen. This picture tells a compelling story. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine what it, what it must have been like to meet this woman 
and get so close to her that she would be willing to show you her life. This is her life. This is the result, not of an accident, but of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. uh, a journalist friend of mine, Karen Emmons, came to me and asked me if I would work with her on a story on domestic workers' violence, and I, I readily agreed. I, this is something I've been uh, aware of since uh, 35 years uh, working and living in Asia. Um, what happens is these uh, young women uh, who want a better life uh, go to places, uh, uh, you know, the Gulf, go to different uh, Hong Kong, or whatever, wanting to make some money, perhaps take the money back and uh, uh, start a business or whatever. And the, they're taken uh, to these countries and sometimes they're not paid uh, physical violence, sometimes they're raped, they're not paid and they have no uh, recourse. Uh, their passport's taken away. Uh, they don't know where to turn. Uh, they're trapped. And it, the, uh, so they, 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 th this happens repeatedly uh, all over the world. And uh, we thought we should really try and, again, tell their story uh, so that some, some, something can happen, some organization or some uh, laws are passed to help these women uh, not have to suffer and endure this, this sort of cruelty. Now, I was in charge of time, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm running late. So, <laughs> so, um, so we're going on to our final uh, uh, shots, which, which are also very important to talk about. I don't want to miss them. Well, this is uh, Petra Nomkova. She's a supermodel f from the Czech Republic. Um, I had been given an assignment uh, to do the Pirelli calendar, which is traditionally a nude calendar. I don't photograph news. I thought, how can I do this project in my own way? And I, I spoke with the Pirelli people. and We said, why don't we find supermodels who are doing charitable work, humanitarian work, trying to make the world a better place? And there was no better example of that than Petra Nemkova. She has worked and helped to rebuild so many schools uh, around the world, in Haiti, in Indonesia, in Peru, in Mexico, uh, areas where floods uh, have uh, occurred or earthquakes. So, she so what was a, her personal incentive? Well, she uh, had been vacationing with her uh, boyfriend in, 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 in Thailand. Uh, the tsunami uh, came into the, swept away uh, uh, she and her boyfriend. Unfortunately, her, her, bo her boyfriend was, was killed. Uh, she, she had multiple fractures all over her body. Uh, she clung on for dear life. She was saved. While she was clinging to that tree for eight hours, she could hear the voices of children and other people crying for help. Uh, she, she survived. She was rescued. And she started it. She was, she thought, this is... Uh, you know, this experience obviously has changed my life. I have to do something to help other people. She started this uh, incredible organization called Happy Hearts, which helps to build schools for uh, earthquake victims, uh, flood victims. And uh, she had devoted so much of her life now, I think more to that than to modeling. Uh, and uh, She's so uh, vivacious and has such a great disposition. You, keep, you just have, when she calls and says, I need you to volunteer for me, you have to go. I, I, I've done a lot of charity work for her with great pleasure. And anything I can ever do for Happy Hearts is a great uh, honor. It was an honor to have you here at TEDx Amsterdam Women today. It was my honor to be able to speak to you on, uh, on the stage today. And I would like to thank you for being here today, but I would definitely like to thank you for your talent, sharing it with us and sharing these amazing stories about these amazing women. Thank you very thank much. You so thank, much you. Thank, you. thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. Thank you.